Hope you like discounted knockoff brand jeans. No, those are designer. Have you ever watched an anime empowered on YouTube and went, I want more of that. But then you check the channel and I guess that was it. Yes, I'm gonna be talking about one of those cartoons, that being Becky Prim. With its seventh anniversary right around the corner, I interviewed the creator Carl Hadrica to see what happened with their production. Also to see what he's been up to and what would the future hold for this project. Hello, I'm Ryan. And we're gonna be becking it up in this Prim or priming up in this Becky. Carl is a 32-year-old animator from Florida. Okay, he did live in Georgia for a bit, but later moved back to Orlando. But why mention this seemingly unimportant fact? Well, his mom, Darlene, was an effects animator on a few Disney projects, having moved to Orlando for a job. This would be during the 90s and early 2000s, where CGI was used to enhance 2D, rather than outright replace it in North American theaters. She worked as a 3D visual effects animator for them between 1995 and 2004, and you've definitely seen her works, either from the fireworks and flags in Mulan, or even the genetic guns in Lean Lone Stitch. She would have continued working there if not for the closure of the Disney Animated Studio. You know, the one in Florida? The one I just mentioned? She would reside as an animation teacher at UCF for about 16 years, and currently is in freelance. Growing up, he would see his mom work and want to be like her. And he grew to love the idea of blending CGI and 2D together. Starting in his formative years, he would draw and get critiques of his art from her, and his first art job would be as a portrait artist at SeaWorld. But prior to that, he worked as a crowd vendor at Shamu Stadium. Hey, we all start somewhere. With this experience, he would later find himself at Ringling College of Art and Design, and the blending of 2D and 3D would be seen in the 2013 thesis film, Roadkill Redemption. It would revolve around a woman killing a raccoon and having to give it peace after death. And when posting on YouTube, it got some nice acclaim. While he was in college, he had two undergrad internships at Walt Disney Animation Studio, as well as Blue Sky. At Disney, he would learn under the famed animator Eric Goldberg in 2011. Working with Eric, like, yeah, but I learned a lot about restraint in a way I wouldn't have expected because I thought it would be all the genie flamingos or whatever, but it'd be like, you know, the scene he gave me was supposed to be just like kind of a very nuanced sort of scene where the little girl like, you know, turns around and opens a door. And so then I, of course, had to like, oh, well, have her do all this other stuff. Like, you know, just because like, I'm still kind of like thinking about how much can I pack into a scene? And I still kind of feel that way now, but now it's like, okay, the name of the game isn't necessarily to how much crazy wacky stuff can I have going on? It's like, okay, well, how much, whatever the job of the scene is, however I can optimally have that happen, you know? And even if that means, okay, this is only supposed to be like a transitional 20% little thing. We're not trying to draw attention to the fact that the character, but it's like, okay, but if that's the thing, like whatever the most optimum serviceable version of that is that helps everything overall, you know? And so, you know, but you have to think about how it is married to everything that comes before and after. <gasps> oh my God. The Goon would be his first studio gig after graduating, and that film is rife of lore that I must save it for another video entirely, mainly considering the fact it kickstarted 10 years ago, and it's still not out. Well, maybe, but let's get back to Carl. Okay, and so he would later get the job working at Blur, going from Florida to California in a Saturn. Not Sega, but a car. I think. During his career as a storyboard artist, he would be seen at various studios. Disney, Blue Sky, Warner Brothers, Nick, Netflix, and Studio MDHR. With all these experiences, he found that working in television was more suited than film. To tell various stories rather than hyper-focus on one was something he fell in love with. He'd also meet various animators along the way, such as Tara Billinger and Zach Bellissimo. You may know their works from the wonderful war of Mickey Mouse and Rick and Morty, but you may be more familiar with them from Wangan Gulch. With them talking about their idea, he was the first official artist on the project, helping them develop the characters, world, and story. And in 2021, he won an award. He would receive a daytime Emmy for outstanding individual achievements and animation for storyboarding. This would be for his work on the Animaniacs reboot. And during his illustrious career, Career, he has worked on many shows, such as Spongebob, Teen Titans Go, and even The Cuphead Show. However, something was itching the back of his mind. While some artists dream of working on known IPs, others dream of something bigger, to create their own. And in 2016, Carl would realize his dream with Becky Prim. Feels like somebody pinched my neck. Was that you, Colonial Farm Boy? Wait, what? The earliest concepts of Becky come from his high school days around 2008, even use the same voice you currently hear from the pilot. The character would get more development in his college years when he was around 23, writing down ideas and concepts based on what was around him, such as the art of Cubum Lee and Herman Mejia of Mad Magazine, which helped shape his style. And he talked with me about music and how it shapes his art. 
So it depends on what story I want to tell, I, I, I guess. And I'm always trying, and lately I've been trying to sort of like explore the range of human emotion or whatever. And like, uh, I, I remember for a while, like 10 years ago, all I listened to was like really sad, like consciously was trying to listen to only sad music. Like when I was working on my thesis, cause I was trying to evoke this emotional response or whatever. Becky Prim follows the off-kilter exploits of an angry teenage cynic in her satirically hostile high school world. Think Daria, Crank to 11, fed through a manic cartoon brutality machine. Viewers want catharsis, and Becky Prim can be their primal scream. When she's not trying to find her chill, or just hang out, or whatever, this would be an excerpt from his pitch bible. Carwood pushes his late 20s angst into the cartoon to really shape the world of the characters. Be inspired by the likes of the Venture Brothers, the Max, and the Simpsons, he really likes character-driven shows. For the characters of the pilots, they actually derive from archetypes, some that he's drawn and written for for a lot of his career. Becky would be the outcast, Ella would be Becky's close friend, Nova the nerd, Jessica the preppy schoolgirl, with Stacy and Rue being Jessica's cronies. In the writing of the pilots went through many revisions. Even her name had to be changed. Early on, he would refer to her as Becky Savage. This would be until he Google searched the name to find out it was shared by someone more explicit. Remnants of the oral script can be seen in the trailer, as it actually contained cut scenes from the final script. This is due to Carl consolidating all of Act 2, turning what would be a 22-minute pilot into a 12-minute and 15-second proof of concept. Even then, there was still a lot the draw on his end. Within the pilots revolves around a bench that Becky and Ella like to sit at, but lo and behold, Becky and her cronies choose to sit there instead. This is the drama I live for. Becky would tell them they can sit at the bench over her cold dead body. Then she dies. Her death would be caused by Norville's pet bee, and a motif of the shorts revolve around the winged insect. The bee aspect would be inspired by the film Stung, as at the time, Carl really liked the poster for it. Speaking of posters, for a fun little fact, one of the ones that he used for the shorts uses a textured background made from an inverted scan of a crumpled up piece of paper from his high school backpack. Cool. Back in the pilots, Becky would then possess the nerd to finally reclaim her bench. She would do this by giving her enemies visions of their deaths via a tree. The final shot would be Norville, possessed by Becky, and Ella sitting on a bench. However, the series would not have revolved around her being a ghost. In fact, there was going to be an epilogue shot of her getting her body back. However, at the time, Carl chose not to create the shot. He would then get many comments asking if she was a ghost, and if that was the main aspect of the show. You know, maybe do a director's cut, where you just draw like one little more scene in, going like, oh, nope. He's fine. It would be easy because he voices the character. And as a little fun fact, this creepy red guy is a reference to the lipstick face demon from the Insidious franchise. A lot of people, I think, when the pilot, like, because that's the thing, I called it a pilot, but really, that animatic I made would have been probably the season finale. And that's why it would have been extra shocking to see her, like, drop dead, like, you know, four minutes in or whatever. But I, I guess, like, yeah, what it would have been, like, a, a teenage derelict cynic trying to find her chill. Yeah, this is ours now. Ours now. And we're just gonna have to learn to accept change. It's a part of life. And besides, I don't see your name on it. It's carved in the back. Over the years he'd been working on it, he'd switch from Adobe Photoshop to Storyboard Pro to create it, even using his MacBook's microphone to record the voice. And he did nearly every aspect of the project. Writing, animating, editing, and voice acting, aside from Sean Wu, who voiced Ello. He truly gave his all for the cinematic. With his concept, he wanted to prove he can create a finalized project. While he has done work for many companies, he wants something to point at and say, this is all me. And so if the project completed, he would try and pitch it around. And so that's where this pitch bible came from. It would even include episodes that would come later down the road. And since you're here with me, I'm gonna read two log lines. The two log lines from the little, little book. It's actually a PDF. You could have got one of these at Lightbox Expo in 2019. Wait, you don't know what a log line is? Okay, it's basically a short paragraph or less describing the story. It's way easier to say like two sentences than to try to fumble your words telling me how super interesting your story is. Because people just get bored. You know. When this thing. First, we have Becky's obsession. Ignoring her straining order dating back to her childhood, Becky revisits an unhealthy life obsession with an alt rock band. And next, we have Fall Formal. The night of the formal dance, Becky hunts down an owl that stole her $45 corsage from its nest. There's other ones, but I'm not gonna read them. I don't know. Within these pitch bibles, you add extra episodes to try and give networks an idea of what you want to create. With the show, he wanted to create something based on revenge, obsession, and vengeance. Think of it like Daria and Dan Versus mixed together into an angsty teenage girl. And needless to say, a lot of people would relate to this character. At the time before you reach 8 million views, it reached 5 million. Hey, we all start somewhere. It's important to have these numbers in the pitch, as having a pre-fan base can help its chances getting, well, 
created. She has one hotel for a good example. He even showed that fans sub the pilots in 11 different languages, and some fans would even dub it themselves. Now that's dedication. To this day, he gets comments and emails requesting it to be a series. However, as of today, no such thing came to pass. When it comes to pitching ideas, there can be a number of hurdles even if you get an interested party. Anything from company restructuring, to just, we already have a show like this, and we're, we're gonna go with that one instead. Then you later find out that they never went with that show either. It can really put a damper on your self-esteem. However, for someone like Carl, that has and stopped him. And he's been up to a lot more than just pitching the show. And if you're liking the video so far, don't forget to like and sub. And also go check out my podcast. It's animated. Thanks. At the time of writing, as of May 2023, Carl switched to freelance work. With his time out of the Hollywood sphere, he's been casting a wider net when it comes to branding. You see, with his past works being that of SpongeBob, Looney Tunes, and, of course, Mickey Mouse, you can get pigeonholed into a certain category of animation. So to help expand his net, he started to work with my good friend Meat Canyon on his animations. The first being an episode of Melvin's Macabre, Gutterball in which he worked as a storyboard artist. He also worked for Spindle Horse and Hellboy Boss. And having a bit more freedom when it comes to freelance work, it gives him a larger palette to sample from for those hiring and even accepting pitches. This would also be for the opposite if he wanted to work in children's cartoons, but only drew for Family Guy and Big Mouth. So when it came to pitching Becky Prim, it's more so targeting the same avenues he'd been working at, that being Kid or teen-centric networks. With the expansion to more adult works on his resume or IMDb page, it can open up more opportunities for the character pitches. As in the pitch bible, he points out that Becky doesn't have to smoke in the show. But what is Becky without her ciggies? Some compromises cannot be had. And the difficult thing about having an idea is you might have to sit on it for many years. A famous example would be that of Phineas and Ferb. The show was pitched around in 1993 by Dan Pavanmeyer and Jeff Swampy Marsh. It won't be until 2007 would the show get picked up, with some changes to the characters of course. It's difficult to describe how agonizing it is to have projects like this. To see the many comments asking for a series, they're complaining that we won't get more, since the average person doesn't know what's going on with people like Carl. Which is why I like making videos like these. Be sure to like and subscribe, my buddy. If you think that's something, Carl's got even more secretive projects you don't even know about. What you can know about Bro Ghost, it was a short-lived comic series he drew back in the day. You know what? I want to see more of it. He's funny. You just have to be okay with like the fact that it doesn't always happen, or you have to just keep trying and just try to love and enjoy the process. But when it came to Becky Prim, it was more than just a pitch. Starting with being the son of a Disney animator, he wanted to make a name for himself. But on top of that, he wants to do more than what he's already known for. Going back to what I mentioned before about pigeonholing himself with kids' cartoons, that can weigh down on one's mind. To be perceived on the surface level based on your limited works can shape the outside community's perspective. And so for Becky Prim, that is 110% him, right there. In all of its messy glory, the authentic Kyle is there, mixed in with his blood, sweat, and bee stings. In fact, on his website, this would be alongside Roadkill Redemption and his Mickey Mouse works. And even to this day, the project is still true to him. Part of the genesis of it was like making something that's like a calling card that shows me playing to all of these strengths and things that I enjoy. Like, you know, what it would look like if was involved in everything, you know, because it was all, you know, I boarded it and edited it, wrote it, voiced most of the characters, except for my friend Sean, who did Ello. And I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make something that was like indicative of what it would look like if I could pitch a show or something and like I wanted to like prove that I could and then but it, oh, it sort of just became yeah this like calling card or whatever I, I, I suppose. And throughout the years drawing in the industry the shows were rather not the best part of the experience but instead it would be the people he met along the way. I feel like for me it really does not matter the studio doesn't matter at all it's just the people you know and I can point to my favorite experiences, like I loved working on Vanicula with Jess Baritsky. That was like one of my favorite show experiences, even though it's like a show no one really, you know, they didn't really even air it. It wasn't, you know, and, but you know, but I, that was just such a great experience, such a nurturing, wonderful crew and environment and great people. And Cuphead was like similar. Like I, I really loved everybody on Cuphead and they were to this day are still some of my very closest friends. While working on mainstream IPs is fun, at this point in his life, he'd much rather be working with something new. When restricted by canon, it's hard to break out of the mold. This can be seen in Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, which originally was going to be a Star Wars film. In breaking loose to create something new, you can explore characters and stories you couldn't have imagined before, such as Carl helping his friends shape Long Gone Gulch into what it is today. For animatics like Becky Prim, it was such a story that resonated with so many people, it still has them coming back to it to this day. When I asked my audience about the pilots, it lit up the eyes of many a viewer. One comment said, Try to make it a point to watch it every year. If it was released today, it'd have a ton of backers since there's more interest in indie animations. 
another comment said. I absolutely adore it. Carl Hadrica has been a huge inspiration for me in my work for a long time. It's crazy to see how far he's come in more recent years. Becky Prim has been a staple on my animation radar for years now. It's definitely one of my favorite shorts on YouTube. And so drawing in freelance has brought him into a new chapter of his life. While freelance is not a break as he's still working, it does allow more time to find oneself, to see what is around you and appreciate what there is. I talked with Max Gilardi about this, that what it means to create isn't just the sum of your parts, but also what you've gotten out of it. And so far of Carl's life, he's met his longtime partner, Megan Boyd, of whom he met at Ringling College of Art and Design. And you may know her from her works on Wacky Racers, Middlemost Post, as well as Becky Prim, and her own shorts, PJ and Mr. Yes. The latter will be an extension of the End of Universe cartoon that Becky watched in class. So go watch that if you want more Becky content. As a fun fact, she and Carl would appear in Becky's classroom during the opening scene. And in this scene and some others, Becky has a misplaced thumb. Along the likes of his friends Tara, Zach, and many others, it's been an adventurous life in creating art. With his friend independent works, it opens new opportunities to meet even more creators like him. In helping inspire artists on their journey, he's back in the same drawing pad with them. And in this chapter, he can once again show his more authentic self. Be it in his art in Meat Canyon or Spindle Horse, these more adult animations allow him to stretch his creative legs more than ever before. And as a previous comment said, indie animation has had a resurgence. And recently, Hubble Boss won the Streamy Award for Outstanding Animation, and Hasbun Hotel is still getting a series. With Becky's 7th anniversary coming up, the character still lives on, the hearts of fans. And to this day, Carl is still pitching at the studios. And maybe one day, we'll see the show pop up on our feed, on one platform or another. But in the end, even if the pilot is all there is, is a work that inspired many people back then, and will continue to do so for many years to come, either in creating their own works, or just to create in general. Because it was like, in my mind, a direct attack towards like, you know, a person or an institution or a thing or whatever. And like, you know, and then that, in the end of it, you end up something with something that just like resonates because you put like a piece of like energy into it that maybe would have otherwise consumed you. But while you're in this space making a thing and being real and like, and you, you may as well like exploit it and harness it and make something of it, you know? You got lemons and it's time to make some fucking lemonade out of these goddamn lemons, motherfucker. <laughs> What's up, Bello Jello? Becky? Hey, yeah, thanks for watching, and be sure to support me on everything. Literally, everything. My Twitter is YouTube channels and Patreon. Also, go check out my animated podcast, Saldus JJ. Ooh, we're moving. I know you haven't seen The Flash yet, but why didn't they just go back to Jesus times to see what he's been up to? You know what I mean? I don't know. Until next time, keep on drawing, and don't forget to have fantastic. Oh,